normal times, in non-COVID times, because it's looked very different for the last 18 months. But in normal times, the very exciting thing about being a conductor is that no two days are alike. Um, if you're in a concert week, so if you're preparing a symphony concert, um, usually you'll arrive on in the city on the Sunday or Monday, start rehearsals then on the Monday or Tuesday, and concerts are Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or maybe Saturday as well. Some places are Sunday morning, and you're usually back on the plane on Sunday, heading off to the next city or back home to swap suitcases. Um, that's a concert week. If you're doing opera, it's a very different story altogether because doing opera, um, if it's a premiere, as is the Zalame that I'm preparing at the moment, there are weeks of rehearsal in the rehearsal studio with just a pianist without the orchestra, just with the singers, the director and the pianist. While everybody learns the staging, establishes the concept, establishes the music musical parameters for the singers, Singers um, are a bit, if I keep coming back to the to comparing with athletes, it's, it's very similar. They are like athletes. They have to practice. They have to get to know the course. They have to spend time in the venue. They have to maximize their performance so they peak on the main days when they're performing and not just on rehearsal days. They cannot give 100% in rehearsal, despite the fact that we are all expecting them to give anything and everything. Um, and uh, so there are the weeks of the rehearsal with the singers. Parallel to that, I might be coordinating with the music library to help them prepare the orchestral material. Most works exist in two or three different versions, so we will have already made a decision as to which version, and that might involve editing of the orchestral material. Um, there might be three different printings, an American one, a German one, a Russian one, and you choose which printing, and um, after 35 years in the industry, you know the pros and cons of all of them, and you might choose to take a little bit from this one and drop it into that one. Um, so that's going on. I'm coordinating with my assistant who is taking musical changes I make in the rehearsal studio with the singers to the library to make sure that information is in the orchestral rehearsals. And then you get to the final stage run through, which we had last night with piano. And then my focus goes to the orchestra and I start rehearsing the orchestra. And basically the orchestra have approximately five rehearsals to learn the entire piece and the last two or three of those rehearsals will be with the singers together and the staging and then it's the dress rehearsal and you're on. So those last two weeks of rehearsals, final rehearsals with the orchestra, when the singers then also have to contend with not just the orchestra but lighting, costumes, makeup, staging, the works, um, it's all just putting that together for opening night. And then then things calm down. Then you have a couple of days off and then you have the next performance. Then you might have two or three days off and the next performance. But what usually happens for the conductor is once opening night happens, you start toing and froing between cities while you start preparing your next show. And that's exactly what's happening now. I will be starting uh, seven o'clock the morning after the premiere. I'm on a plane to Vienna where I start rehearsing for performances that begin later in September. And on the one rare occasion when I actually have four days off between two shows, I have to fly to Dublin in order to get my US visa. <laughs> so, you know, these are, the life of a conductor is constantly changing. And uh, there's, uh, you think, oh, don't you have people that do that for you? No. You still have to go and do your visa interviews yourself. And, um, you know, you're staying in accommodation that uh, I, I prefer to stay somewhere where I can cook for myself. I've got a bit more space. But if you're only in a city for four or five days, you're probably in a hotel. Um, you know, it, it all sounds extremely glamorous. 
And there are plenty of occasions when it is an extremely privileged life, but it's also a very hard working one. And that doesn't include the long term study. I'm currently preparing seven weeks of concerts where I literally go back to back Oslo, Stockholm, Paris, New York, Washington, Los Angeles, San Francisco, seven weeks in a row and a different concert program each week. Now, each concert program comprises roughly through between 300 and 400 pages of music. So that means in those seven weeks, I'll be dealing with something like between 2000 and 2500 pages of music that has to be here. So of course, all those scores are traveling with me. You see me travel with lots of luggage. No, it's not clothes and shoes. Most of it's scores. <laughs> Most people, when they see a conductor, you're only seeing the last bit of the performance. Um, again, comparing it with athletes, it's like you're seeing the finals of the race. You're not seeing the getting up at five o'clock in the morning for the athlete to train and for a musician, you know, those hours between five and seven or six and eight in the morning are the only hours when emails don't come in and there are no phone calls and you can actually get some solid study time done before the day's rehearsals begin. Um, you also have to know how you tick mentally and emotionally. I know that if I'm conducting Zalame, a performance that evening, I've got brain space to study something else until about one o'clock, but at one o'clock the day has to stop and I just have to focus what I'm doing in the evening. If it's a huge concert program, then I don't have any brain space to study at all that day. I'm, I just need to rest and focus and, and be ready for the performance. So you really have to know what each performance is going to take out of you mentally and emotionally also what each rehearsal is going to require from you and then you have to adjust and plan your preparation for the next things around that so I, I'm, a, I'm an inveterate list writer I have lists on my desktop on of the of my laptop to do lists with works coming up all color coded as to how much time I feel I still need to invest in them and a time plan of when that study is going to happen and when they're going to be slotted in. Without that kind of level of organization, um, you can just get into a complete pickle. And it's, it's really hard for young conductors when they're starting out because they just have to take anything and everything that comes along in order to get into the industry. At my stage, my calendar's planned three, four years in advance. So that makes it possible for me to have that kind of level of preparation and organization as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's quite extraordinary. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I feel very honored. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think it, I think there can be a misconception that the arts and particularly classical music, which is possibly the most, um, if you like, the most sort of rarefied as viewed by the general populace, it's the most rarefied form of the arts. I, I think people forget the broad application of what we do. Um, what would a video game be without the composer who wrote the music behind it? What would a film be without those incredible scores? Um, every piece of music you hear on the radio, whether it's a song of any kind of genre, right through to the kind of music I, d I specialize in, there have been a mass of creative people working behind that to create that. And that is, that is what gives us joy. I mean, when you think about what we've been through collectively, the global experience of the last 18 months, what have been the things that have kept us going? Music, film, TV, books, it's been the arts um, and science. And it's fascinating 
I talked to most scientists, almost all of them were very active in the arts as teenagers, as students at the university. You know, we talk all the time about STEM, but I love it when people, people talk about STEAM. Add the arts to the STEM and everything drives at a whole different pace. It's so much more creative and we need to develop and broad and creative and civilized minds. You can't listen to good music and not feel compassionate. Um, and I mean, there's, we need that at all times, but at the moment, I feel we need that more than ever. The, the whole thing of being kind to one another um, is, is even more significant. And music creates civilized, experiences and um i i am in essentially a pretty ordinary person i've had kids i've got grandkids i i made brownies yesterday for the cast i do my own shopping and if i'm staying in a hotel i wash my undies in the bathroom sink you know i'm i'm a pretty straightforward down-to-earth kind of person i just do this weird profession where I stand in front of a hundred musicians and play Wagner. But that makes so many people happy and gives so many people joy that I am grateful to have this bizarre but wonderful profession. Look, it's a, I think it's an incredibly difficult decision. Um, my own experience personally has been that if I hadn't moved to Europe when I was 25, there is no way I would have become the artist that I am today. But it has meant a great many personal sacrifices, a great many missed family occasions that, that uh, one is terribly sad to have missed. Um, it means moving away from a country that we all love and feel very strongly about. Um, however, the, the truth of, of the classical music world is that Europe is kind of where so much of it takes place. And whether you immerse yourself in it for a year or two or a lifetime, um, I think it is an invaluable experience. And I don't think, I don't think we need to think less of ourselves as a nation of artists by acknowledging that getting experience, kind of getting the word from the horse's mouth by, by spending time in Bayreuth and soaking up what Wagner did there by, by sitting in the middle of the room of the water lilies in, in the Orangerie in Paris and just taking in those water lilies and um, thinking about what that meant to the Impressionists and how that developed their music, learning the languages. Um, all these things inform, develop and improve you as an artist and I think it's invaluable, but it's up to each individual to make the decision when is the right time for them and for how long. I, I would never give anyone the advice to say, you must go overseas and you must do it now, unless they came to me already with a sense of frustration that they had come to a certain point in their career and they didn't seem to be able to progress further. Then maybe it's time to change the venue. And um, Australia has a limited number of venues. Um, you think, you know, the only full-time opera company is in Sydney. There are a number of very fine state companies. There are 64 full-time opera companies in Germany, in a country that has roughly three times the population of Sydney. Divided by three, you've still got 21. Uh, we don't have 21 opera houses. Uh, so if you're involved in that kind of world, I think the European experience is essential. And then it's up to you to make the decision of when it's the time to go home, if it's the time to go home, or if you find yourself as the lucky few, like myself, like people like the composer Brett Dean, um, 
the violinist Ray Chen. There are a number of um, singers, Nicole Carr, Siobhan Stagg. There are a number of very fine Australian artists who have actually made Europe their home but have the great good fortune to spend a chunk of each year in Australia. And that's why I'm particularly looking forward to my new position with Sydney Symphony as their chief conductor because it will bring me home three times a year for a total of eight, nine weeks or so and a number of fascinating projects. And um, yeah, I feel incredibly privileged and lucky that I can combine my two worlds, my two great loves this way.